Hi, everyone. Welcome to our palliative and end of life committee meeting. I think we're at the most fun time, right? So we're all feeling good. We've had a great day so far, and now they've saved the best for last. That's right. That's right. Um, so welcome. We've handed out some agendas. So we have a few slight modifications. Um, I'm Marie Bakaitis, and I'm one of the co-chairs. My other esteemed co-chairs here will um, introduce themselves when they when they come up, Dr. O'Rourke and Dr. Krauss. Um, so welcome, and we would uh, like to begin our meeting with some of our uh, new people who are first timers to this meeting. If you would each stand, all stand up, and then I'm gonna start over here and have you just say your name and where you're from and why you're here. So we are we have a few people we know for sure are new timers who are coming. So anyway, in this group, do you, would you mind standing? <laughs> This is the first time I have this career, and I, I think I'm the first person. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, we'll that's okay. Well, we can start on the other side. <laughs> Welcome. Well, thank you and welcome. Well, we're delighted to have you here. Other first timers on this side? I can't see behind the post. No? Um, do you mind? You can run up to run up to the mic. Hi, uh, Al Lopez. I'm a medical oncologist at Kaiser San Francisco, and uh, we do, are very interested in palliative care for our patients and uh, trying to propagate better and better uh, protocols. And that's why I'm here. Welcome. Great. Thank you. Some other new first timers here in our group. Okay. Oh, run on up. Hi, I'm Eric. I'm a physician assistant in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. Um, first time here. I've been doing it for about, gosh, five years now up there. So, um, yeah, first time being a part of this. Great. First time ever in San Francisco. And I have to come back next year. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, my name is Carly Stott. I'm a nurse practitioner out of New Orleans. I've been practicing as a nurse practitioner for about three years, but I have been a nurse since 2012. I'm excited to be here. It's my first time, but my interest is in early phase clinical research, but I'm looking to expand that by being here. Welcome. Thanks. Other first timers from our group here? No? So um, I'm, my name is Stephanie. I'm from Amarillo at um, Harrington Cancer Center. I'm a new research coordinator. Um, I didn't have anything to do this evening. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, but I just left. Well, you know, um, palliative care is more than doing yeah, nothing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, uh, I I just left um, floor infusion nursing, and um, during COVID, I lost over 30 leukemia, lymphoma, and cancer patients, so palliative care is what I did, and so I just wanted to hear what y'all were doing. So. Thank you. Welcome. I hope you come back. <laughs> so... And Oh, sorry. I'm Brandy Heckman Saturday. I'm chief of the Breast and GYN group in the Division of Cancer Prevention. This is my first SWAG meeting ever. So I thought I'd cover our whole portfolio and come see you as well. <laughs> Great. Well, we definitely did save the best for last. So welcome. Some other folks over here. Yes, thank you. Hi there. I'm Daryl Nakago. I'm the new bladder cancer patient advocate from the Chicago suburbs and palliative cares quite important. 
Absolutely. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, I'm Laura Esfeller. I am the kidney cancer patient advocate, um, and I am a metastatic kidney cancer survivor. I'm an ED now. I'm originally from New Orleans uh, area, although now I um, live in Southern California. So thank you. Welcome. Thanks so much for coming. I am Allison Rosen, the AYA research advocate and a 10-year colorectal cancer survivor. So excited excited, but really interested in this topic because unfortunately I've lost a lot of my friends due to colorectal cancer. I'm sorry, but you got the memo about the green jacket. So <laughs> good for you. <laughs> Hi everyone. I'm Karen Costello. I am also very new to SWOG. Um, I am the um, advocate representative for the prostate committee as a caregiver. And I am a 30-year um, oncology social worker who has been um, very interested and very involved in palliative care for patients and caregivers. So I'm interested in being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome. I'm Manali Patel, always vertically challenged at these uh, podiums. I'm a thoracic oncologist at the VA in Palo Alto, just a hour, actually two hour drive today with traffic. And I also work at Stanford University. I focus on trying to innovate novel models of end of life cancer care delivery to improve equity and really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, great, thanks. And we'll be hearing from you in a little bit too. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Maria Garcia Jimenez. I'm a medical oncologist at uh, UCLA um, and also practice at one of our safety Net hospitals, all of you in Silmar, California, um, interested in breast and cervical cancer specifically, and also um, just access and equity of care for Latino and primary Spanish speaking patients when it comes to end of life care and all, uh, clinical trials. Um, this is my first SWAC meeting. Thank you for inviting me um, to be part of the committee um, and looking forward to hearing more about what's being done. Thank Great. You. Welcome. We're, you're in the right place. Uh, and I'm uh, Chris Manns. I'm a GI medical oncologist and health services researcher at Dana-Farber. And one of my interests is in trying to improve communication between patients and clinicians uh, about their cancer diagnoses and their, their preferences in care so that we can improve care near the end of life. And in particular, how to deliver these interventions in the community setting where most patients get their cancer care. Welcome, Chris. Thank you for coming. So did we get everybody? See, you're not alone. Okay, big round of applause for all our new people. Wonderful. Great. Um, so the the uh, meeting for those of you who are new is we have a we'll be starting with uh, some advocate. Um, uh, where we go? First of all, I'll just leave this slide up for a second, uh, which is our mission statement and objectives, which we're always revising. Uh, and we're always looking at and evaluating. So just so you know why we're here. Um, and our agenda today, besides our welcome and introductions, is we will have our um, advocates and other um, committee liaisons um, just go through and give any uh, give their quick updates. We'll have our plenary, and then we're going to go through developing studies, um, pilot studies, uh, closed studies, and our new concepts. And by then we'll be ready to go um, to our next step. All right. Um, so first let me uh, go through our um, uh, patient advocates. So um, Valerie, do you mind uh, coming up? Are you, oh, 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 you're gonna come up together, good. Well, Valerie, I was gonna let you introduce your group. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Valerie and I'm the lead palliative and end of life committee advocate. And I've served with the committee since 2019. I'm a 15 year survivor of inflammatory breast cancer. And um, I'd like to introduce several other advocates who have also been involved in the work of this committee. Uh, Carol Siegel, right here. <laughs> and uh, Lee in the back over there, um, both um, very instrumental in the work of this committee and um, Lee Jones, and we're happy to have him. 
He's the lead advocate on the survivorship committee and a survivor of stage four colon cancer. And Carol is the lead advocate for the GI committee and was a caregiver to her husband who lost his life to pancreatic cancer. Um, both are long-term advocates with SWOG, and we've each played an advocacy role in many of the ongoing studies and concepts that will be discussed today. I'd like to briefly highlight some of the recent work of our uh, patient advocacy committee that supports SWOG research. And Carol will also talk about some resources and other topics of interest, which could be a benefit to our work on this committee. So as patient advocates, we continue to support our work with membership and leadership, and of course, um, diversity, equity, inclusion champions, and other supportive committees as DEI is uh, further developed and rolled out within SWAG. We are looking forward to working with Don Dizon in these efforts regarding vision for DEI and the PAC role therein. DEI champions will be working on five pilot um, pilots in communities, breast, GI, GU, lung, and myeloma, <clears throat> and we'll be there to support pilot committee trials. The committee has also been very busy with developing and recruiting uh, selection pro process for our PAC chair and vice chair roles. So there's going to be a transition in the fall with regard to that on our committee. And our community advocate program, which I was very involved in, is invaluable. And we currently have four very active community advocates representing the Latinx, uh, LGBTQ, uh, adolescent, young adult, and veteran communities. And uh, this program is one that will continue to grow and as new advocates come on, this program will become more and more important. Um, sadly, we recently lost one of our community advocates. I just want to um, honor him, Howard Conrad. Um, he lost his life to cancer on May 3rd. And he was a representative from our older adult community. And, um, he was a great asset to the community advocate group and also to our patient advocacy committee. Um, Howard was an amazing individual. And if you get a chance, if you go on the SWAG website and just look at his bio, you'll, you'll know what I mean. <laughs> um, and he, he was very active on the committee and um, he was active in his, his own personal life. Um, community advocates will work across SWAG committees to provide a, fun, a frontline patient view and voice for their communities. Um, we had a great discussion in our patient advocacy committee on this yesterday, um, and uh, we're continuing that discussion. So we've also recently onboarded, which um, you've met some of them today, um, some new research advocates. So Trisha Hernandez will fill the position of Hildy Dillon on the Lymphoma Committee, and Daryl Nakagawa, who will fill Rick's, Rick Bang's committee position for bladder cancer. He's right over here. As well as Karen Costello, who, who came up to the mic, and Laura S. Feller, um, both to fill the prostate and kidney cancer research advocate positions. And we're excited to have them here. So please, if you get a chance, reach out and welcome them. Um, we're, we're excited that they're in this meeting also. It's exciting to see all of our advocates active and engaged on their committees and outside of their committees on research groups and within their communities, advocating for patients and contributing to clinical trials that are patient-centric. So now I'm gonna pass this along to Carol, and Carol will now give you an update on module six, which is our um, diversity, equity, inclusion team science module and tool. 
And um, she also has some other inf interesting information that she'll share from her professional development. So thank you. Um, well, as you know, uh, module six is the latest addition uh, for Im improving uh, the diversity and representation of clinical trial participation participants. Uh, researchers, I'm happy to say, are uniformly supportive, but we are all waiting for the next step, uh, which might be able to uh, uh, give us uh, uh, the ability to measure diversity during the trial that reflects the actual disease distribution while still allowing time to broaden the DEI distribution. This tool needs to be practical uh, without requiring statistical analysis. The goal is to divide, define the standard practice in a clinical trial development and process. So we need your feedback whenever possible. Uh, as part of the professional development, ad advocates uh, can attend conferences and with the goal of bringing back these resources and information to share. I participated in the SWAG uh, Advocacy Summit and learned about a legislative effort uh, to prohibit copay accumulators. In recent years, some healthcare insurance companies, employers and pharmacy and or pharmacy benefit managers have shifted payment for the high cost prescription drugs to the patients. Some charity, fortunately, some charity organizations have stepped forward to cover all or part of these copays. And this has led to the copay accumulator programs where the patient does not receive credit for the copays paid by the charitable payments. Only after the value of the donation is exhausted will the patient's out-of-pocket costs begin counting to their deductible. Now, the help insure lower help insure lower patient, as in help, Copays Act would prohibit the use of copay, copay accumulator programs and require health plan, plans to count the value of the copay assistant to the patient. So if you can, please consider contacting your own representative and senator urging support for this Help Copays Act. Uh, to the House, you would ask them to uh, co-sponsor HR 830, the Help Copay Act, and the Senate, you would, to your senator, you would ask that they co-sponsor the Help Copay Act upon introduction. Uh, it, this is important, I think. Uh, the other legislative asks that were, uh, are in this session is to address prior authorization burdens. And I think we've all heard horrifying stories about how uh, patients have had to wait until the authorization comes through. And you know, it's anyway, we'd like to address that and to support greater cancer research funding. Uh, it turns out that like 11% of cancer research trials are being adequately funded. So we need uh, which makes me as a lay person think that the cure for cancer might be in some file cabinet someplace. So we can't deal with that. Um, anyway, I do have the message for con hard copies of the messages to Congress, if you could take one. And with permission, maybe I will email them. And we'll to send them out. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. So um, we have an oncology research professional ad, uh, 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 liaison, uh, Melissa Faust. Melissa, I don't know if you're here or online. No, okay. 
Um, and um, I wanna recognize Dr. Bernard Parker in the back of the room. Uh, Dr. Parker is our uh, representative to the uh, NCI. Uh, Catherine Guthrie is our um, biostatistician from SWAG, or, or the head of all of that. Um, and um, Dr. Virginia Sun is here, and she is our executive liaison. And Virginia, I was going to give you a, a minute or two to say anything from um, exec that you might want to share. Thank you. Um, just very briefly, you know, we have a really lovely, you know, session here talking going over all of our research. Our coaches have worked really hard in terms of you know moving these um, concepts through. So we'd love to hear your feedback. We'd love to. Come, you know, come up and talk to us if you have questions about SWOG and the type of research that we do as well. And finally, as the executive officer, I'm here to serve all of you. So please come to me and ask any questions. I'm happy to help in any way. Thank you. Great. Um, Dr. Frank Myskins is here. He is our senior advisor and he will seniorly advise us along the way. Uh, I'm sure you will uh, contribute as uh, you feel the need. Um, and Dr. Dawn Hirschman is here, and she's the grand boss of all of our NCOR studies. Dawn, did you have anything that you wanted to say or contribute? Okay, I know you won't be shy if there anything comes up. Um, terrific. So uh, without further ado, then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mark O'Rourke, who's going to introduce our um, plenary speaker. Oh, I'm sorry, I had one other announcement. Um, the AYA committee has asked to um, get have a new liaison. Um, they're looking for a new liaison from our committee to the AYA committee. And so this is an opportunity for leadership from our committee um, to the AYA committee. And so um, if any of you are interested in being considered for that position, please uh, come up to one of us co-chairs and let us know. And also they wanted us to let you know that there is an AYA trials tab on the CTEP website. This is a picture of what it looks like. And so I encourage you to go and check that out um, as they try to get us to be a little bit more prominent, uh, AYA issues to be more prominent across all of the SWAG committees. So now Mark. <laughs> Uh, it, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Ashwarya Sabaya. Come on up. You can, uh, as she's coming to the microphone, uh, she uh, is a, a medical oncologist, uh, a palliative care, and um, an early investigator uh, trained uh, at, has been at MD Anderson uh, these past 12 years. She's been an active member of our committee from day one and has been involved in our um, advanced care, uh, communication, education, and uh, advanced care planning effort, uh, and is one of the early stalwarts in our committee. We're delighted to have her present her research today. Thank you very much, Ms. Warren. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for this time, everybody. This is one of our earlier studies, and it's just, it's very much grassroots. It came out of conversations that started here, continued on Zoom, and are back here. And I'm pretty sure I haven't met a couple of the people that we've been meeting with weekly in real life until today. And so, because I didn't remember Matt Hudson being this tall. So I, I figured I had, it's like, I don't think I met him before. So in person, rather. So it's such a pleasure. Let's get to let's get right to it. This is just a little bit of our. Oh, I was just going to. Oh, if you want, is, does, is that syncing with this so people can see? Or here, I guess. Yeah. Or I'll, I'll use the pointer here so the Zoom people can see too. Perfect. So this is the pilot feasibility study of a virtual asynchronous communication skill. I'm going to say exactly why we picked this particular module, but we had to cram in all of the adjectives and the descriptors in the title uh, in case that's as far as the study goes. And so you know, the this umbrella of difficult communications, this was close to Dr. O'Rourke's heart. And we wanted to do something else, but he insisted that we work on this. And so the, the committee was young. And so you pretty much just do what the chair says. And so I'm just kidding. We all wanted to, we wanted to get, make communications better in a way that matters to patients, but it's the current paradigm um, was that 
really their formal communications training maybe happens in fellowship to an extent, maybe residency perhaps, but after that, you're pretty much kind of on your own to just master some basics on difficult conversations and the highest impact ways to convey key information. And so when we, the, the, the need that we established was these routine conversations that we face that directly impact those metrics of outcomes that that matter to folks who are probably not in this room, unless some of you are also uh, the the proverbial bean counters in your in your roles. But point being is, so much of the outcomes that matter to a hospital system and a health system are impacted by palliative care, and we can trace those back to conversations. They don't have to be difficult conversations. Conversations, period. And so. What our goal was is to identify what are ways that we can convey key dimensions of effective communications to oncology clinicians at any stage in their career, at any part in their professional life cycle, regardless of whether they've had extensive training or whether they feel they're heavily self-sufficient in this. And so you can hear elements of feasibility, effectiveness, and accessibility to clinicians in practice. I say this as someone who literally spent Saturday morning doing training modules just so the emails would stop that they're overdue. And so, and I was not working on Saturday morning. And so it's really, what is the best way to convey some key bits of information? What is the most streamlined way? And how can we measure the impact of a communications program? So this fell under an umbrella of concepts that we discussed. So this is at the very earliest part of this, and you'll get a sense of uh, future directions with this space. So the first thing we did was to do a landscape analysis on what is out there. What do clinicians have access to if they wanted to get quick pearls of wisdom on how to structure a conversation or how to structure difficult conversations when you're conveying prognosis, et cetera. We found about seven different programs out there and they range the spectrum of a handout to a one week kind of immersive course so somewhere nice, of course. And so with the clinician in mind, in, in the multidisciplinary clinician in mind, we really looked at what were the common themes across these programs, what were the consensus themes that are meant to be a focus of difficult communications. And, and what this also meant was that I, get to, I got to take some of these classes slash all of these classes. So it, it's a, it was a, an immersive period to say the least but uh, trained out for sure. Um, but the good news is, is we these were the five themes that really consistently came up in, in, these, um, in these training programs. And so it was delivering serious news, discussing prognosis, clarifying the goals of care, conducting a family meeting. And the corollary to that is gonna be conducting a virtual family meeting, which there isn't a training module in case somebody wants to create one here today. Uh, and then the those nit nitty gritty advanced care planning conversations where the endpoint isn't just the exchange of information, but it's actually completion and decision-making on the, on the patient's part. And lo and behold, our friends at the Center to Advance Palliative Care, CAPSI, had a course that had these exact five themes as the title of the course. And so the this particular um, communication skills training was about three and a half hours total across the five modules. And it was self-paced and it was a um, uh, entirely virtual base, but it was interactive with the interactive with the with the program itself. And so after having taken those courses and, and our members of our subgroup were part of this um, journey as well, uh, is we found really great ways to tell one another that no, we're not gonna be doing that. And so the CAPSI course emerged as one that from a balance of time commitment standpoint and autonomy to the clinician, as well as the breakdown of how the time was allocated across the modules was one we felt most aligned with a clinical professional and their responsibilities outside of taking training modules. So with the feasibility as the first dimension, a first primary outcome, but again, this is part of a longer, um, a larger vision for optimal, optimal uh, exchange of training related, communications training related information. But the first step was of course the feasibility component. 
So no matter how great we thought it was, it was still a time commitment and it required a level of um, uh, level of, of buy-in. And so we, our primary objective for the study was the feasibility of the course completion. And so we measured this as a 60% or above adherence rate among the enrolled clinicians who complete the online curriculum within the uh, a two week period. The two week period was, was relatively arbitrary. It seemed to be where the measurement points were in other training program studies. There were ones where the program was longer. If it's a multi-day program, it seemed more reasonable to, to do a, um, a, a, a four week window of time if it was self-paced. But we we're like five modules, 30 or so minutes each was a two week window. And we measured a, a series of baseline um, demographic characteristics as well as uh, baseline individual characteristics. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the measures that we used. But the goal was to assess um, uh, baseline levels of hopefulness of, of, of uh, burnout using the Maslach Burnout Inventory, the abbreviated, as well as um, to estimate the effect size of this intervention, this program on clinician confidence, both at baseline, immediately post-course, and then four weeks down the road. And so we picked this purely because this is of the early study in this in the in a in, in any trajectory of, of clinical studies. This really was not designed to be the one that answers long-term improvements, long-term being three, six, 12 months and beyond. With this one, it was purely, can we actually get people to do this and, and answer a few questions about it? And then we additionally looked to um, measure the patterns in clinician engagement. Remember, we really wanted a training program that was as accessible to clinicians as possible. And that meant exploring asynchronous training opportunities rather than show up on this date at this time for the um, uh, for the training. And so we worked closely with the, the CAPSI team to measure some back-end user metrics, time of engagement, time spent in the modules. There were several uh, interactive components that involved um, clinicians actually typing in some responses that they would share. And so there, there are opportunities there to analyze the, the quality of the feedback that they provided to the system in response to a difficult question. And so these are part of the um, uh, putting some, the, the icing on the cake, if you will, as the exploratory outcomes. But again, the goal very much was the feasibility component. So to review the, uh, to review how we approach this, um, we wanted to look at the clinician population, physicians, advanced practice providers who practice in a specialty of oncology. We didn't limit it to medical oncology. We'd gone back and forth about this. I think there are so many elements of the experience that are different from med -onc to surge -onc to rad -onc to gyn -onc, And so that definitely merits consideration in the future studies. But for the purposes of the feasibility, we opened it up to all who provide care for persons with cancer, of course, providing consent and who are willing to complete the assessments and had reliable internet access. And so the timeline that we crafted for this is the baseline assessment at week zero, that is the, the single link access to the study itself. You complete the consent, you complete the assessments right away on the next screen. And then on the screen right after that, you're taken to the course. I share, I spend half a second talking about that because this could have gone a number of different ways, right? This could have been individual steps that were manual that involved a study team member um, having to chase people down or it, there, the workflow could have been very manual, but we worked with our, our both ourselves as well as um, our regulatory body at my institution to make it a one-click process. So the attrition rate was one, where it was only one person who clicked the first link and continue and didn't uh, continue through to the uh, the course itself. And so I'm jumping to a, a fun part of the result, but none, okay, what I consider fun, maybe you all appreciate it too. But the point being is that the second, we gave people the two week window and after they completed their, the course, the five course, the final screen with CAPSI, we worked with CAPSI to where the final screen took them directly to the post-course assessment. So the two-week assessment was, um, it, it wasn't week two 
it's up up to week two, but it was right after the course was finished. So if you finished it in three days, you really could you could have you would have done the post assessment in three days. But the point of it is to assess this uh, the changes in self efficacy right after course completion. We built that into the CAPSI system. It wasn't a separate email that a coordinator had to trigger uh, manually. It wasn't, uh, there wasn't a delay in waiting to see who completed the courses, et cetera. It was built right in with the CAPSI team's um, uh, a partnership right from the study design phase. And then we, once they completed that second assessment, that started an internal clock in our Qualtrics to send the four week uh, course follow-up. To that, uh, to that keep saying patient participant. These are our peers, so participants. And so, what you really have is a a low touch approach where it, with the first click, every step of the way, it was automated. The study was automated from that point on, and it was very specifically designed there because what's the 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 alt outcome that's not on there is really to find scalable models of study of for a program that could be relevant across a pretty large population. It's not really just meant for the 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 you know, the fifty people or so who we um, who signed up for this. Nonetheless, this was the approach we took. Uh, from an assessment standpoint, this gives you a sense of uh, what we found to be dimensions that could be impacting the quality of the communications. And so we, so this was based on our literature search on dimensions of individual well-being, individual professional well-being that could impact clinical interactions that have been shown to impact clinical interactions. And um, and then there are ones that were more um, exploratory, like hopefulness, hopefulness translating to uh, the quality of interactions with the patients. And so from uh, for the purposes of this feasibility study, we really just wanted to see if people were going to complete these assessments. And so, demographics, the abbreviated MBI, goal specific hope scale, and occupational self efficacy scale, and um, the SEMC, the self efficacy in medical communication, which was a tool that we developed within our 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 committee uh, within SWOG and uh, validated um, for individual clinicians to report their own assessments of. Um, uh, interactions with patients as well as uh, separately with families, vocational identity questionnaire, and then our favorite Toronto empathy questionnaire. So you can get a sense of the conceptual map that was is brewing in our heads for the, 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 the future prospective study on individual dimensions that can impact the quality of medical communications, as well as uh, possibly individual opportunities to modify mediators of the quality of medical communications. And so I'll give you some of the early results and share what the next steps are with this particular study. And so we invited about 100 people to participate, and um, uh, 54 uh, clicked through to participate in the study. And so the practice settings, these were a majority where 54% were in an academic setting, 33% in the community, and 7%, 7%, uh, 7, .7 uh, participants, 13% had a presence in both. And we're actually finding this to be a more of the norm where it's clinical, uh, clinical exposures in an academic center, but also in community practice centers that are the satellite location. So we're finding ourselves having to define practice settings in a bit more thoughtful way, given that the satellite sites are very much um, set up as a community setting. When we looked at the breakdown of our um, of those who participated, we had 78% uh, of were uh, advanced uh, nurse practitioners specifically, 15% were physicians and 7% were physician assistants. This was, um, there's something to, <laughs> there's a learning nugget in this one too. The proportion who accepted um, as participants were much higher with the advanced practice provider population than with the physician population. And so there we have, we've had individual conversations with those who were invited uh, at our individual institutions, but chose not to participate just to better understand um, what their thinking was behind this, but that was being done on a on a um, uh, as a quaternary outcome because this is going to be this will factor into the next steps. 
As far as the uh, age breakdown, about 42% were in their 30s, 22% in their 40s, and then 19%, um, 50 and above, uh, 50 to 59. Um, the overwhelming majority were women clinicians, 83% were women, and 70% uh, uh, identified, self-identified their race, ethnicity as white. 19 were API and 7% uh, were um, African American. And so when we, the primary outcome findings I'll share here, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we have ongoing with this analysis and what our next steps are going to be. The 54% of uh, 54 participants, um, clinicians who provided consent, 98% um, completed the baseline assessments and went through to the course to start the course. And so we really didn't see attrition in this. Um, uh, we didn't see the attrition that we would expect from our all of our survey studies in the past. Um, and the the one person who did uh, who did stop uh, stopped after the second survey. So we're guessing it. And the you could see the duration of time that this person spent. And unless it really took four and a half hours to answer your demographic questions, I suspect this person was being being pulled in different directions, purely theoretical. But from an attrition standpoint, it was uh, it was um, um, we were pleasantly surprised. The of the fifty four participants, the primary outcome is at the two week point. That's how we defined our feasibility based on other studies done of training programs in uh, for a healthcare audience. And so, the two week point um, uh, course completion uh, was the the adherence rate target was sixty and above, and we were at sixty one percent. So that's a positive study. That's a positive study. So thank you to the one person who came through at the end, I guess. But um, <clears throat> the point being is, you know, so we had 33% of our of the 54 who completed the the baseline, who went through the five course modules and completed the uh, the the immediate post assessments. And so the feasibility threshold that we set of 60% is actually was met. So we have uh, data that we're exploring right now uh, with the CAPC team. They're actually pulling the, the, the free text for us to better understand the, the free text feedback because we wanted to undersee how was the time distributed across the modules? How was the time distributed across the, the module slash concepts? Because these were very distinct training concepts. And were there ones that seemed disproportionately higher, more time consuming than others? The where this also that data also becomes incredibly important is um, is the I'll I'll jump ahead to the future directions and then come back to what we're measuring. Is we're actually like I said, this is the early study in a program programmatic approach to act, to modify patient outcomes right and so this is really about how does the clinician training and how does a, a very select focused training for clinicians impact patient facing outcomes both with satisfaction of care quality of communications as well as the patient's own clinical outcomes um, as it pertains to goal uh, goal concordant care and so when we looked at, when we had this goal in mind, it was very clear to us that from the beginning, the approach will have to keep in mind what could be the mediators of it. And that's part of the reason why we selected that CAPC course is were there individual mediators that we could, uh, that we can measure down the road as being more, more associated with a favorable or unfavorable patient outcome. Because the iterative nature of this study as part of a portfolio of studies in the medical communication space is where does, if we had X amount of attention to allocate or X amount of attention to ask of our clinicians, where is the biggest bang for the proverbial buck? And so this is part of why the approach to the study was so heavily focused on long-term elements that we can see as um, as being modifiers. And so when we, our ongoing analyses um, does include the 
before and the near term outcomes uh, for each one of these dimensions. And part of the, the questions that we're actively asking is not just the interim change in these measures, uh, of both of burnout, but also of hopefulness, empathy, and self-efficacy, but really to look at uh, predictors of baseline um, years of training, their site of practice, urban versus suburban versus uh, rural practice, as well as in individuals' roles. We do have our uh, physicians as well as our advanced practice providers in this, in this particular study, and to see if there is an association between their roles and their uh, self-efficacy score. And additionally, we're actively analyzing the score, the association between baseline burnout, uh, hopefulness, empathy, and self-efficacy on subsequent change. Are there characteristics of a individual at baseline that would be predictive of taking a different training approach that would be predictive of emphasizing it in a different way. And so there's a vast body of knowledge in the organizational psychology literature on delivery of training to employees in a, in a, in a, in a, a non-healthcare system and how it can be adapted, the delivery and to an extent the content can be adapted based on that individual's profile up front. And so just found that to be fascinating. But the point being is the this is the first step of, of many to establish what are approaches to communication training, not just from a program standpoint, but also from a design and delivery standpoint, because this is as much about palliative care as it is about implementation science, if you will. And so this is work that came together over many, uh, I mean, pre-pandemic, BC, it's a BC work before COVID we started this. And so the um, our, our SWAB co-chairs have been incredibly supportive of, of all of us and our, our subgroup and several of whom are here and maybe listening on Zoom, but uh, Mark, uh, Marie, Rajiv, Ben, Dave, Lauren, Valerie, uh, I sound like, um, you know, I'm reading at my kid's graduation and you know, just a bunch of first names, but the point being these are wonderful people and Carol has been with us every step of the way, Valerie has been with us every step of the way, incredibly thankful for these insights. And so uh, this is a work that was funded by a seed grant. Imagine submitting a grant application with literally no preliminary data. And that is exactly what the seed grant is there for. And we're incredibly thankful to them for this uh, high risk, high reward uh, risk that they took on us because it did give us some key insights into how to engage with clinical teams as well as in study design when it's in a resource, um, uh, it, it's always a resource limited approach, but that, so how we can maximize um, involvement. So I'll pause there and hand it back over to our co-chairs. Great, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Laurie, there's a couple of questions on Zoom and Perfect. I'm going to ask them to um, email them to you sure. directly so that we can Absolutely. Um, keep our, our meeting going. And uh, thank Sounds you like a plan. for the update and we look forward to the rest of it coming soon. Great. Um, Thanks, thanks everyone. Uh, I wanted to also mention that um, I neglected to see uh, Kate Castro also from NCI on our committee. So wave Kate. Um, uh, and uh, there is a new member uh, who joined us who is also on Zoom. Uh, I forgot to ask the Zoom people. So uh, I want to welcome um, uh, Oh, she disappeared. Okay. okay. Jerry Joe, uh, please put your name in the chat again uh, because it's disappeared. So, okay, we're going to move on to our developing studies updates. And so, our first one, we have four studies to be presented. Um, we're going to ask Dr. Blanke if he would mind going first since he's here and he has to, uh, to move on. Uh, and so he's going to come up to the podium and talk to us about uh, depression screening and treatment in patients requesting medical aid in dying. And I am going to get you to your slides and then we'll get back to the other ones. So there. There you go. Uh, perfect. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. So you've heard the title of the project 
And just for those of you who didn't hear it before, our original concept was going to be a phase three trial testing whether effective treatment of depression at end of life in patients making a request for medical aid in dying lessened their desire to actually use the lethal medications. But there was so little background information that that study had no chance whatsoever. Specifically, we were unable to power it. We then proposed a phase two trial to determine that rate of depression in the population seeking made, but the steering committee had a few concerns and most of them were in the arena of feasibility. And then from out of the blue, this miraculous U34 planning grant <laughs> with a pilot feasibility trial appeared. And I felt like it was written for this project. I'm sure you all know this and probably heard more about it last night, but I'll just remind you that the, the purpose was to support studies for the acquisition of data critical to designing and completing a larger study. And here are some of the circumstances quoted. It could be useful if you have a lack of information about the population, the intervention, the statistical planning, or operational risks. And we pretty much had all those things lacking. Again, we don't know the rate of depression. We don't know if patients who are seeking MAID, who to be very frank, are often in a big hurry to actually take the lethal medication, would be screened, would go to see mental health specialists if they uh, were screened positively for depression. Um, if we could get the system ready to see those patients quickly, perhaps within the waiting period before you could write the prescription for MAID. And we also had a variety of stakeholders who did not normally work together on oncology trials. So for the pilot study associated with the project itself, we have our primary and secondary objectives. The new primary is to assess the feasibility of universal depression screening using a PHQ-9 in a nationwide cohort of patients with cancer who are making their first verbal request for MAID. And there are a whole host of secondary objectives that really are sort of looking at the outcome in those patients who screen positively. Will they go see a mental health specialist? Will they accept treatment? Will the treatment work quickly enough, et cetera? So this is just a quick schema. Again, we're going to take people who meet MAID eligibility criteria, which are fairly uniform across the 11 venues where it's legal. They have to be terminally ill with a less than six months estimated survival, and they must be adults. And of course, they have to have decisional capacity. They will make their first oral request for MAID, and then we will hopefully consent them for this trial, offer them the PHQ-9 if they accept it and fill it out, and they have no or mild depression, which is basically a score of nine or less. We'll still follow them for some of the outcomes, but if they have moderate or severe depression, which is a PHQ of 10 or greater, we will offer, of course, not mandate mental health referral. Now, what's our ultimate goal to do that phase three trial that I told you about before? We want to see if treating clinical depression in those seeking MAID actually decreases use of that procedure, if we can uh, decrease or improve made specific survival. But there are a lot of very interesting secondary objectives that could be part of the later trial. We could look at rates of ingestion, of course, of lethal medication between the two arms, which is pretty much synonymous with death. But it'll be interesting to see the time of ingestion of lethal medication. If treating depression doesn't obviate the urge to die, does it delay it, for example? We want to look at regional differences in the rates of clinical depression. There are good data out of Oregon, but very few data out of any of the other 10 venues. Um, we want to look at a variety of demographic groups, including underserved patients uh, in those patients seeking MAID. And we want to very, very preliminarily look at the effectiveness of pharmacologic or intense psychotherapeutic treatment, meaning percent response and time to response in patients with depression seeking MAID and actually getting treated. So here's the actual update. And I know we have folks from the NCI, but I want to actually tell you that our meeting with the program officer and the chair of the steering committee were held. And everybody was very warm and very friendly, including the chair who perhaps did not love the original idea. Uh, so again, they were much warmer toward this idea, though at the end of the call, Ann Geiger warned me that she had fielded 66 calls about the grant that day alone. I don't think she was trying to be discouraging, but she wanted us to be realistic. So here's the timeline for what we hope to achieve. Um, we're forming a stakeholder advisory council as part of the grant application, and that should be set in a couple of weeks. We already have about two-thirds of the member. The uh, application goes in on June 26th of this year, and we'll finalize our study site shortly thereafter, although we have letters of support from about four of them so far. The pilot proposal should be ready to go to the central IRB shortly after the new year, and we are hoping the trial will activate in April of 2024. Based on our rate of accrual of approximately four patients per month, and then, of course, total number we need, we think it'll finalize accrual in February of 2025. We'll look at data over the next several months, and then we will make our go, no-go decision on the phase three, which, of course, is the purpose of the U34 by October of 2025. That's me. 
That's great. So um, questions for Dr. Blanke, please come up to the microphone. And for those people online, um, there are questions that are coming in. We have an unstable connection, so uh, I may or may not be able to see them, but I'll do my best. So let's we'll start with you. Yeah, good, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, doctor, for the presentation. I just had a quick question. I want to make sure I'm understanding your schema correctly. There, there comes a point where you offer the patient an opportunity to participate in the PHQ, and they either accept or reject. Is that correct? Right. I mean, so it's, it's a bit of a subtle point. We're assuming if they consent to the study, they're essentially consenting to take the questionnaire because it's going to happen five minutes later. And I can't imagine why they would consent to the study and then five minutes later change their mind. So okay. it's true that there is a possibility they could change their mind, but then they're going to accept or not accept the questionnaire. They probably will accept it. And then we're going to see if they are clinically depressed at a moderate or higher level. And then the question is, will they accept referral to a mental health specialist? Okay. And, and could you speak to any potential bias that may be operating given the schema that you've outlined? Um, I'm not so worried about bias as I am worried about pressure. I'll be very frank. I see eight new patients a week now in my death with dignity clinic. And these people, these patients um, really, really, really are uncomfortable. They're suffering quite a bit. And they very much, for the most part, want death with dignity. I don't want them to feel any pressure to going on the study. And we're going to have to figure out how to handle that as well as, of course, explain it in grants. All right. Thank you, doctor. Thank you for those questions. Yeah, I'll tell her from UC here, San Antonio. So for the patient to be eligible, should the request for medical assistance in dying be communicated to the MD directly or could it come from the family member? Sometimes yeah. patient can say, I want to die, or can you help me, to the family member? That is more of an issue with death with dignity than it is for the actual study itself. So medical aid in dying in the 11 venues requires the patients to understand what will happen if they take a lethal medication. They will die with 99.6% certainty. But all the statutes state they have to be capable of making and communicating decisions by themselves. They can't do it through a family member. They cannot do it through an advanced directive. Okay, thank so you. we'll have similar eligibility for the trial. Thanks. And while um, we're getting up uh, a question online, seemed like the initial primary outcome was change in the desire for MAID. The new is change in the use of the procedure. Why the change? Well, we couldn't actually power the original trial, even though I think it remains an important question, and that's our ultimate goal. Um, again, we have data from Oregon on the frequency of depression at 26%, but there are other publications uh, that look at depression at end of life, not specifically made, that have that percentage as high as 77%. So that's a huge range, and we really need to know what it is across the U.S., not just in Oregon. Thanks. Thanks, Jack. Uh, Eric Rowland. Oregon Health and Science University. Um, I have a question um, about just a very practical issue. If, if we do refer someone to a mental health expert, how do we guarantee they have access and that insurance will cover, uh, especially across a country? And how, is, how have you guys kind of thought about that? Well, we have thought about it. So we are making it a requirement to be a pilot site that they will guarantee they can get the patient in within one week. If we do this trial and we find the phase three is positive for decreasing um, made specific deaths, then the system is going to have to really worry about it. And we'll have to talk about how we can expand access and make it more rapid. Hi, in Hawaii, we actually have, that's part of our process. I, so we wouldn't be eligible. I'm sad. Here's okay. why I'm sad. Okay. Hawaii has an incredibly diverse patient population. Oregon, 97% of patients using death with dignity are Caucasian, as is our overall population. So I desperately wanted to recruit Hawaii. I was actually a consultant when you guys were passing a law and I know the groups that do it and I love Hawaii, but they have mandatory psych referral so we can't achieve our objectives, which are, are the patients willing or not? Thank you though. Great. And again, thanks for having me. Thank yeah. you so much thanks. for the opportunity. Thanks. So uh, I'd like to now introduce um, Dr. Jonathan Sham, who's going to come up and talk about his um, study of lanreotide for pancreatic fistula and give an update on this concept. Great. Thanks. Okay. I mean, this is an old set aside. I should say palliative uh, you know, care committee at, at the top there. Um, good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Sham. I'm a surgeon researcher uh, at the University of Washington Fetish Cancer Center, and I'll just be 
giving a brief update on where we are with our lenreotide for prevention of postoperative pancreatic fistula trial. Uh, just for a brief review for those of you who aren't surgeons in the group, postoperative pancreatic fistula uh, is leakage of pancreatic rich enzymes from the pancreas after cutting through it during pancreatectomy or pancreas surgery. Uh, it's known as the Achilles heel of the procedure. It doubles direct health healthcare costs, decreases quality of life, delays life preserving chemotherapy. Uh, and also associated with decreased overall survival. This is data from MGH, uh, which shows a median overall survival of 30 months. If you don't get a fistula in about 17 months, uh, if you do, and, and again, with the hazard ratio of 2.8 is the strongest predictor of decreased survival, even more so than uh, positive nodes uh, and high C99, so pretty impressive. Um, after maybe about a year of work, I'll say, uh, this uh, with this committee and others, uh, here is the schema as it stands. It's pretty simple, which I think is a huge asset uh, to, the, to the proposal. Uh, about 274 patients, you either get lenreotide or don't, standard of care after that, um, and then we measure outcomes. Primary outcome is so-called clinically relevant postoperative pancreatic fistula. Those are the ones where you're getting drains, antibiotics, interventions, uh, the ones that really change the course of the patient. Secondary outcomes, uh, biochemical leak, which is like a mini fistula. It doesn't really change uh, the patient's course, hospital length of stay, uh, and uh, quality of life metrics uh, that are pancreas specific. And then some exploratory outcomes, including um, the, these are things like, does the patient's stomach work after surgery? Is there bleeding, time to initiation of chemotherapy, and also hospital readmission? Uh, and then they were also kind of building in for later analysis, some cost effectiveness um, endpoints uh, and, and transitional, uh, translational studies. Um, here's the eligibility criteria. We think this is a, another huge draw for the study. It, they're very broad. Essentially, almost everyone who is getting a distal pancreatectomy fits into this criteria. For the phase two, 90% uh, of patients met inclusion criteria. And actually, most of those who didn't, it's because we didn't have Spanish language uh, for consent, and that was the most common uh, common cause. And obviously, that'll be rectified for, for this trial. Um, and essentially, anyone getting uh, surgery for a histologically proven or presumed malignancy um, in the pancreas. And then some exclusion criteria, what you'd expect if you've gotten a somatostatin analog, like if lanreotide uh, previously in the last six months, um, and some other kind of medical issues. Um, here, just a brief review of the statistics. Um, thank you, Catherine and Katie, for your hard work and, and input on this. Uh, we really went conservative uh, with estimating kind of sample size and, and power calculations. Uh, our estimated or our, our observed rate in the phase two trial was only three percent. We bumped that up to seven, you know, just to make sure we, you know, um, uh, we would we would uh, see an effect if it did exist. Uh, and then again, uh, a total of 246 patients uh, that would be analyzed uh, with a 10 percent uh, dropout rate up to 274. That dropout rate, those are patients who go to the OR most likely. They think they're going to have surgery, and then oh, there's metastatic disease found occult, uh, and they don't end up getting pancreas surgery. But you know, again, it's intra-op, so we can't know that. Um, and yeah, and as far as feasibility, as I mentioned, very broad inclusion criteria. Um, we've already contacted some high volume centers, and because of this broad inclusion criteria, we think that uh, rule is going to be reasonable at around 2.5 years, and that's again with a very conservative 20% enrollment uh, at least those centers. Uh, it was 54% for the phase two. Um, so I just want to thank members of this committee for your support in developing this, the Hope Foundation uh, for support through the Coltman Award, uh, Robert Krauss, again, Katie, Catherine, and of course, Christy for helping us um, put together the capsule, capsule slides, which I think are on deck for submission to the executive committee imminently. So happy to take questions. Great, thank you. Some questions. Um, let me look and see if I have anything online. So I have a question. How do you keep your um, morale up throughout uh, more than a year plus of the study planning? Um, I am really kind of emboldened because this has been such a learning experience for me. Uh, again, I'm a junior investigator just starting out. Uh, and I have these literally world experts at my fingertips, an email or, or text away. Uh, Robert and I meet every every other week. Uh, and so it's like this free uh, intensive clinical trials course that I'm going through. Uh, and again, this has also led to, to other things like being placed on committees and national organizations and, and stuff. So it's really just um, 
such a, an honor and pleasure to be a part of it all. And again, thanks for your help as well. Well, thank you. And there is our poster child for the Coltman Award. So Yay Hope Foundation, thank you. Thanks. Um, our next presenter is Dr. Nick Dion Odom, who is from the University of Alabama at Birmingham and is coming to us on Zoom. So I need our assistants here to uh, help with that. So Nick, I think you could just unmute if the thunderstorm- Can everybody hear me? Yep, perfect. Great. Good evening, everybody uh, over, over there on the West Coast. Uh, my name is Nick Dion Odom. I'm a clinical trialist intervention developer of interventions for family caregivers of folks with advanced cancer. been doing this work for about 10 years now. One of the things that we've observed in developing and testing interventions over the past two decades have been that we've actually had great success in developing a lot of great things that work. However, we've had extraordinary difficulty getting them actually implemented into um, cancer center practices. And so what's the field in my little world of cancer caregiving research has been is about not only developing interventions that are really effective, but also very scalable and able to be implemented um, into existing with, with existing personnel and resources. So many of my trials have included distress screening as part of a more comprehensive multi-component intervention, but we've never tested distress screening by itself. So uh, over the course of, a, of an implementation study where we uh, developed this distress screening that's very much based on the NCCN patient distress thermometer um, with a very similar protocol, we developed a, a parallel protocol for family caregivers that we developed in partnership with our neuro-oncology department. It came to be called Family Strong. And uh, now we, wanted, we need to do a, a clinical trial to actually demonstrate that it's effective the beauty of this type of intervention is that's very quick. In our pilots, it has taken on average about 11 minutes per encounter uh, to administer this thermometer and then provide appropriate support to family members. And uh, in addition to that, we've been able to have it be administered by a variety of, of practitioners, including lay navigators. Um, so it really is quick, very easy to implement, easy to train people to use. So for this trial, originally it was a smart trial but after discussions with uh, committee members um, and others, I uh, tried to simplify it, uh, as this would be my first time doing a cooperative group trial, to uh, a more traditional two-arm uh, RCT. Uh, in technical terms, is a type one hybrid implementation effectiveness trial because it would have an economic aim, but it would recruit 294 family caregivers and their care recipients with newly diagnosed advanced cancers, uh, through SWOG member cancer centers. Uh, again, the intervention would be lay navigators administering the thermometer that you see there. Uh, those lay navigators would be centralized at the University of, uh, uh, University of Alabama at Birmingham performing this intervention telephonically, which we've also been doing in our clinical trials for years now and offering uh, problem support over a 24 week time timeframe. Um, if you're asking why lay navigators, because if we can demonstrate it with lay navigators, then that means anyone can use it. Um, and it also uh, adds in our uh, view to the uh, scalability of this type of intervention. The primary outcome would be caregiver distress at 24 weeks as measured by the hospital anxiety and depression scale. Secondary outcomes uh, would include patient distress, patient and caregiver quality of life, caregiver burden, and patient healthcare utilization. Could you go to the next slide? So yeah, just keep on clicking until you see everything show up. So again, the way this trial will be structured, oh, go back one more, was we'll be screened uh, medical records or I'll have to talk to SWOG member cancer centers to see how they want to do this, but screen for folks who've been uh, newly diagnosed within the past 60 days with stage three, four progressive and or recurrent cancer and their primary family caregiver. It'd then be randomized either family strong or to usual care. The total sample size here would be uh, about 254 uh, individuals. Uh, this is assuming a 30% attrition rate, which is pretty typical for a palliative care trial. Data collection at baseline in 24 weeks would be the primary outcome time point. Uh, the proposal is undergoing, I think, executive committee review soon. Um, Virginia has to kind of tell me what to do. 
And the target funding mechanism um, is listed there in CI and with, for the October 2023 cycle. So that's it. Love to hear any questions folks have. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Um, while anybody is trying to come up or post any questions, could you, because uh, this is the opportunity as this study is going to be going forward and there's people representing various sites here, could you explain how you're going to recruit, how you were going to ask coordinators to recruit caregivers when it's the patient who's coming to clinic? So typically, and this will be a conversation that I'd you know, love to hear from um, you know, you all and others, typically what I've done in the past is have coordinators screen the medical record for folks who've been newly diagnosed. If they've been doing any diagnosis with advanced cancer, uh, we all, we have been over the COVID era, been mailing uh, an opt-out letter to those patients, asking them if they um, have an interested family member that some, another member would be calling them to recruit them by phone. We've often had a waiver of signed informed consent and done informed consent uh, over the phone. And then we've consented the patient, and then um, they give us the contact information for the families, and then we contact the families and consent them over the phone as well. Um, we've also done in-clinic recruitment. Typically, family members do accompany these individuals to their clinic appointments, given the advanced stage of their disease. And so typically, that hasn't been that big of an issue in terms of identifying a caregiver for this particular population. Thanks, and I know there's, go ahead, Virginia. There's um, uh, a lot of excitement around uh, around getting this trial going. So I think we had discussed this previously. So a, a good suggestion is to consider adding a nurse coordinator on these protocols who generally, and I will point to Krista Braun Inglis as the S1820, we'll talk about that later, um, nurse coordinator. And she also represents the perspective of an NCORP site and how to actually get this done and really give really good feedback in terms of how we can get it done within community and corp sites. So I would suggest considering. And Jamie Myers, Dr. Myers, our um, chair of the Nurse and Research Committee can help us with finding nurse coordinators. That's excellent um, suggestion. We, we discussed that. So Nick, you'll be hearing uh, soon about um, a, uh, a coordinator being appointed. Um, Dr. Eric Rowland has a question. I'm sure, oh boy. You, <laughs> I'm sure you and Murray have thought about this, but for those of us that don't do caregiver research, I'm curious why it's a focus on family and not just caregivers at large. Um, so maybe you could speak to that. So we define, well, I mean, we use the term family caregiver, but in definition, it's it's that unpaid individual who's either a blood re relation or not, who provides the majority of uh, health support, you know, to an individual who's unpaid and doesn't necessarily have to live in the same home. So that could be a blood relation. Doesn't have to be. It can often be a, a close friend um, whom we've often had. It can be a neighbor. Um, so long as this person endorses that they're sort of the primary person who's providing support to this person due to their cancer. Does that help? Or are you talking about paid caregivers? Yeah, no, that I think that was the, the answer. Oh, got it. Um, so Nick, thanks. And um, we're gonna move on to our next study. Great. So we're thanks. really excited about, um, about this work and uh, uh, to be continued. Um, now I wanna introduce Dr. Jay Kim, who's gonna speak and my screen's gone blank. So you can tell them the name of your study. Okay. Um, so I'm, the concept is a telehealth uh, self-management dietary intervention for uh, gastroesophageal cancer surgery. So uh, I'm a thoracic surgeon and I operate on patients with esophageal cancer and um, patients who undergo surgery for esophageal cancer have a lot of quality of life issues related to eating um, that lasts for a long time after the operation and sometimes permanently. So a few years ago, uh, Virginia Sun and I did uh, a needs assessment in this population. We also included patients who had surgery for gastric cancer because they have a lot of the same issues. And out of this needs assessment, we developed um, a, uh, an intervention that we tested as a pilot study. And the intervention was uh, really based on the chronic care self-management model. Um, 
and uh, and it it grew out of this idea that patients who um, have eating issues after these types of operations often end up um, doing self-management and they they basically the the most common way they deal with their symptoms is through diet modification. And there's lots of evidence from other diseases like uh, inflammatory bowel disease or diabetes that when you want to have people modify their diets, you know, self-management is a um, is a good model. It works much better than just educating and telling patients you should not eat this, you should eat this instead. Um, I think we all know that that doesn't really work even in our own lives, right? Um, so the problem isn't like you don't know what to eat. It's just um, kind of the developing the tools to do that. So um, we did this pilot study. And based on that, um, we wanted to put forward a, um, a concept for a larger randomized trial. Um, and the pilot study was successful in accruing patients. We accrued uh, approximately 80% of eligible patients. And we did the pilot in English, Spanish, and Chinese. Uh, Mandarin Chinese, and it was a telehealth intervention where we had um, uh, nutritionists who were trained in self-management coaching, and they did four sessions uh, over a four-month period. And so we've pr we're proposing a randomized trial that will take place in the post-operative period for patients who've had curative intent for gastric or esophageal cancer. We'll do a baseline assessment um, and after surgery, um, as they begin to to eat uh, in their recovery period, and the idea is we'll do four telehealth sessions, um, and it'll be randomized to this intervention group and sort of an enhanced usual care group. So the usual care group will also get uh, like a a manual, a handout, a booklet that in, uh, that is actually the uh, from the NCI that that gives advice about eating uh, for cancer patients. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, I presented this um, virtually at the last meeting and we um, got some very good valuable feedback from the executive committee about the endpoint as was uh, that we proposed was uh, quality of life and using the ARTC um, QLQ C30, which we used in our pilot. Uh, but the the feedback was that um, you know to be more specific with the endpoint, and we kind of went through um, a few things, and um, you know what we what we found, looking back at our pilot data was um, that uh, we could that there was a difference, although not statistically significant. The pilot only had about twenty patients in each arm, um, so it wasn't designed to to show a statistically significant difference, but just um, the feasibility. And um, there's a summary score for the um, QLQC30, which um, is a mean of 13 of the 15 scales in, in the 30-point uh, score. And this is um, a validated endpoint in, in many studies, and it's actually prognostic for overall survival as well. And this is just data, data from our pilot, which shows that um, the intervention arm did have this is a change in the scores over six months. The intervention arm had a change of um, about nine versus just three in the control arm. So that difference is considered um, clinically meaningful. The the minimum uh, minimally uh, clinically important difference is uh, considered five to ten for this um, endpoint. So kind of this is just uh, represented in a different way. Uh, so we think that this would be um, an endpoint that could potentially, so the funding mechanism that we're um, aiming for is a R1, and we think that this would be an endpoint that could be funded, uh, but I'm very uh, eager to hear feedback about that. So could we uh, have any questions either online or from the group? Because I know that the questions and uh, thoughts that you had from the last meeting did help guide guide you here. Um, so I, I did have one question about the other endpoints are some physiologic labs and things like that. 
could you just comment on sort of the the balance of quality of life versus some of those um, out, uh, outcomes? Yes. Uh, so um, we are as secondary endpoints, we're looking at just um, some markers related to nutrition, um, including uh, so uh, some obje objective markers like albumin, weight, and we're also going to look at sarcopenia, um, looking at uh, the skeletal mass index from CT scans that are uh, obtained as part of standard of care. So... Did you do any collect any of that? Data yes. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So we did, and there weren't statistically significant differences um, in the pilot, but um, we are able we were able to collect that data. Yeah. Just a technical question: um, Is there any data for gastrointestinal function um, after different approaches to esophagectomy, like Ivor Lewis transhiatal? And if so, is that accounted for uh, in the trial? Um. So there is data um, from just looking at qu quality of life with um, patients who've had esophageal cancer and surgery, and um, but not like a fun not functionally. Um, and I'm not sure about physiologically. We for the pilot we stratified for um, gastric versus esoph esophagectomy versus gastrectomy, and we're planning on doing that for the larger trial as well. For, for gastrectomy, there is, that has been looked at, it, and um, there really is no difference based on the type of, um, you know, whether you create a reserve, uh, reservoir or not. And so, it, but all that will be, you know, collected as well. So, thank, thank you. you. So, now we're going to um, move on to our pre-SWOG pilot study updates, and these are the very promising concepts that are um, underway that we hope will um, grow up into the, uh, the other category of studies that are concepts that are moving along the executive committee. So first, uh, we have uh, Dr. Jamie Myers, who's going to talk about two different studies, that two different pilots that she's got um, going. So Dr. Myers. Thank you, Marie. Good, good afternoon, everybody. So as Marie mentioned, these are pre-SWOG feasibility pilot studies, which we are very interested in looking at the relationship between sleep disturbance and levels of fatigue and cognitive function. And we're very interested in that for two populations, one being women with breast cancer who are on endocrine therapy, and one being men with prostate cancer who are receiving androgen deprivation therapy. Because ultimately what we'd like to come back and test are interventions which would help improve sleep quality in these two populations for which sleep disturbance is a very significant problem. The study designs are very similar in both pilots, Participants are given a wearable wrist-worn device called a ready watch, and that employs an algorithm that was developed by the Department of Defense to measure sleep metrics, specifically what a participant would be able to access would be the total hours of sleep, sleep interruption, sleep efficiency. And that algorithm also translates at any given hour during the day to a ready score which is a prediction of their level of fatigue and their level of cognitive readiness based on previous cumulative sleep metrics. The app pairs with their phone and they can also access sleep hygiene education modules, which will give them some tips on behavior changes that they can make to try to improve their sleep. So in both studies, people wear these watches for two months and they complete patient reported outcomes electronically. We're using REDCap at baseline, month one, and month two. So the pilot for breast cancer is being conducted with the PI is Dr. Lauren Fowler, and it's open at Prisma Health and the University of South Carolina. She got internal Prisma seed fund funding to uh, support her work. 
and the target originally was 50 participants. We're running a little short on time for the licensure for Fatigue Science, which is the company from which we get uh, the Ready One apps, but she has enrolled 33. She's only had attrition of three. One woman decided she didn't like wearing a watch, and we had two that had technical difficulties. So she expects to have full data for 30, which is a decent size for a feasibility pilot. And um, just a teaser, she did an interim analysis, which would indicate that there may be some specific variation between aromatase inhibitors and the effect on sleep disturbance. So stay tuned on that for more, hopefully at the fall meeting. What's different about the prostate cancer study other than the patient population is this is a two-arm study. So in addition to wearing the watch and having access to the sleep hygiene uh, education, at the one-month mark, half of the men are randomized to also receive a virtually delivered brief cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia intervention that we previously piloted in this population and, and had successful results. So this is funded by the Oncology Nursing Foundation with a goal of enrolling 40 individuals. And I'm happy to say that right now we've enrolled 25. So since the slide was created, we'd have a little bit more come in. It's open at both University of Kansas Cancer Center and Prisma Health and University of South Carolina. We also have had a little bit of attrition. One guy decided he didn't want to wear a watch. Um, we had one gentleman who had progressive disease. And then we had two that one, just the technical difficulties we never could surmount. And one was sort of lost to follow up before he even got the watch. So we do plan to replace uh, at least two of those individuals for whom we collected no data because we still have plenty of time left in our funding period. So hopefully I'll come back with exciting results at a future meeting. I don't know if you want to take questions or just call uh, that good. So yeah, there's one question online. Um, how open are patients to filling out the electronic forms via REDCap? And are there any hints to promoting completion of the forms in this format? How, how open are they to completing them? And what was the second half? Um, any hints to promote? Any, any hints? Them? Ah, okay. You know, we've had pretty good uptake on that. We're using the red cap functionality for sending, you know, the notification by email. And as the investigator, if I don't get the notification within a reasonable time frame that they have done X milestone, I follow up with an individual email and a direct link. And that's been pretty successful. We have had some technical issues, but I really have a nice team with two guys who are my tech support people. And they've been really good about calling people and helping them walk through the initial uh, survey if they're having difficulty. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. And we look forward to uh, the next step and great work uh, with uh, accrual so far. Uh, Dr. Marco Rourke is going to be uh, presenting for our next uh, Concepts and Development, the Hope Enhancement Workshops so on behalf of Dr. David Feldman and Dr. Ben Korn. Hi, uh, it's a pleasure. And just one comment on the last time. I have my uh, ready watch and I have my um, uh, data collecting and uh, uh, there's a real kind of personal interest in keeping track of your own sleep metrics. So I think good things to come from this research. I'm going to uh, present just a, a quick update on Hope Enhancement Workshops. Uh, Dr. David Feldman and Benjamin Korn and Matt Hudson have been involved in this work. Uh, hope is a, a psychological state that can be described in terms of, of uh, goals, pathways, and agency. Uh, it is a state that is associated with good things in terms of positive behaviors and, and a lack of bad things in terms of of negative health behaviors. And um, there's also the opportunity to, to modify hope and have a workshop to improve a person's hope. Uh, we had some publications uh, for the first workshop that was done, uh, it's now, I guess, two years, um, when we had uh, pr uh, healthcare professionals associated with the spring swag meeting, uh, we did a workshop and we published that experience uh, Dr. Feldman and Dr. Korn have published work about hope and outcomes for people living with cancer, and um, we're, we're uh, gratified with the uh, development of, of the whole field and, and working on two pilots now to move that along to set up for a big uh, R01-funded uh, phase three trial. And... Um, 
This is a single session hope enhanced workshop for women with metastatic breast cancer. It'll be done at Prisma with local funding. It's under IRB review now. And this will be a single arm study of about uh, 50 women with metastatic breast cancer. Uh, the second uh, uh, study will be uh, faculty at the University of, California, uh, University of South Carolina School of Medicine in Greenville to look at faculty experience with HOPE and, and start uh, assessing and, and working on um, uh, provider burnout, provider experience, and see if modifying HOPE affects the outlook of providers and may have an impact on provider well-being. Uh, more to come in future meetings, but just to let you know that this is ongoing research and still going. Any uh, questions or comments briefly about HOPE? Okay. We're staying hopeful. And now we have our um, surgeon co-chair, Dr. Robert Krause, because he's an expert at closure. You like my fun? I, I, don't, know, I don't know how to take that. He's gonna talk about the closed studies. So. Here you go. Okay, I have one slide. So I'm just going to give a, a, a brief update on S1316, which was the malignant bowel obstruction study, surgery versus non-surgery. It had a, a, um, a randomized and an observational arm. And so um, our main finding, at least on the original analysis, is that there really was no difference in our primary outcome of days in the house, uh, out of the hospital and alive. Uh, between arms, although there was a difference and advantage to the surgical arm in some of the very specific malignant bowel obstruction quality of life um, issues, such as um, pain, nausea, vomiting. And so um, and so we originally, we did submit it to Lancet, uh, Lancet Oncology. They, re they thought it was a better fit for Lancet Gastroenterology. Our review, I've never seen anything like it. It was at least 100 individual items. And, um, um, but they were really positive. They thought it was a great study and, and should be published, but they wanted a bunch of stuff. And, and so we worked as a team, mainly through Katie Arnold over there, who did an, just an unbelievable job. Her attention to detail is unparalleled. And so we finally um, did get res resubmitted and hopefully we'll get good news soon. So we have a, a lot of other things that are hopefully in the works in some uh, in 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 in, in, uh, in some fashion. Um, Katie is is also working with Cindy Thompson, who those you know um, from City of I mean uh, University of Arizona, and um, they're looking at the the diet related data. It's one of the things this study has. Nobody else has data prospectively collected data for patients and what do they eat after they've had a, a malignant bowel obstruction? Can they eat? Um, and so. And so they're in the process of, of analyzing that database. Um, it's, 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 it's a lot of you know, different things that we want to do. And one of the things that we want to do is look at the malignant, I mean, the MD Anderson symptom inventory GI and the EQ5D. And um, who was originally going to be very much part of the study um, and was a, uh, um, a collaborator on the grant, uh, Jeff Sloan, unfortunately passed away. Um, and one of his protégés, um, Amy Lou Dweck, um, who is is really a lot, he, she's an alliance person, but very well in tune. And we're in the process of getting her the data and she's gonna um, help do that, that analysis. Um, for those that you know, um, I don't know if um, Marsha Grant, she's a nursing researcher. She's retired from City of Hope, but we keep her working. And, and she's looking, one of the things that we feel there's a really good opportunity to learn is we had a lot of amendments that were necessary to keep this study going and ultimately complete it, including adding sites, including our Latin American sites, closing arms um, at different times, uh, making um, our somatostatin analog um, non-mandatory, a lot of things. And so it's a really important, I think, uh, lessons learned to those who want to do such a trial. And so we're in the process of that. Other things, um, uh, potentially looking at uh, ovarian cancer specific, and then and then, and then really we have incredible data on the actual operations that were performed. 
uh, for those that that ultimately got an operation. Those are the those are on the surgery arm and also in the non-surgery arm. A certain percentage of those actually got an operation it was a pragmatic trial, and so we're going to ultimately want to look at those and see. Can we say a difference about what type of operation may be better in, in this setting? There's some data out there, but none collected like like this study. So, so anyway, so the, so so those are some of the things, um, and and more to come. So, I don't Great. think. Yay. So, the next. Uh, so, so Virginia, yeah, you come on up, and you will give a an update on, on eighteen twenty. Go back. Yeah. So yeah. No, go back. Please. That? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'll just, in the, there you go. In the, okay, so I'll be brief. S1820 is a randomized trial of the altering intake, managing symptoms for bowel dysfunction, rectal cancer survivor, um, AIMS RC intervention. It's the intervention versus a um, healthy living education attention control condition. So we completed um, step one registration. We activated in December of 2019. We finished um, accrual. We closed to accrual to step one registration in April of 2022. We have completed follow-up and um, we have um, our baseline characteristics paper is um, I have to get my work done, submit. It's, it's approved by NCI. Thank you, Dr. Parker. And I have the green light to submit to diseases um, of colon and rectum. And our primary endpoint paper um, analysis is ongoing. So we hope to share that with everyone soon. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Sarah, for all your help with the data. Great. Thank you. While Dr. O'Rourke is getting up to talk, uh, introduce our um, uh, new concepts, um, I was remiss in not mentioning Christy Klepko, our protocol coordinator, who's in the back, without whom we wouldn't have uh, anything happening here. And also um, Jasmine Coffey Dunning, I don't know where she went to run to do one more thing for me. She's been passing around a, a sign-in sheet for all of you. So thanks both to Christy, Christy and to, to Jasmine. Uh, Dr. Patel, let me ask you to make your way uh, forward here so we can uh, uh, in, enjoy your talk. I, I want to introduce Dr. Manali Patel, medical oncologist at Stanford. She introduced herself earlier. This is her first SWOG visit. She has been a pioneer in lay navigation for people with advanced cancer, and she's bringing a concept to SWOG, and we're right at the very beginning of developing this, and so this is hot off the presses and you can learn from, we, we look forward to your presentation. Yes, and um, Dr. Ravi Parikh, who is a co-investigator with you, um, he is on Zoom and unmuted, so um, feel free to- Go back uh, and forth. Go back and forth. Um, thank you again. I hate these podiums, so I will move to the side. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to present this concept and really hope for as much feedback as possible. We would love and be honored to be able to um, work with SWOG and actually have this hosted through SWOG, um, certainly with the amazing research that's already been presented. Um, so the name is a bit much. It's called um, Algorithm Enabled Patients Activated in Cancer Care Through Teams. And we'll describe what that is. It's essentially two interventions that um, a co-PI, Ravi Parikh, and I uh, have come together with our interventions, um, hopefully overcoming some of the deficits of each individually. Um, I don't think I need to go over this slide. You all know um, the motivation for the work is that we've seen that about 70% of patients really don't understand uh, their goals of uh, essentially prognosis and goals for treatment. And unfortunately, um, our work has continued to evolve and still we see that this, these numbers continue to be um, persistent. And that is associated with patients' care being incongruent with what their preferences and values may be. And unfortunately, it leads to uncertainty, as I've mentioned, with prognosis um, when patients are passing away and certainly a lot of caregiver burden and distress. And what we've seen in our own work is that there are um, preventable acute care use um, that's actually unwanted. And so you can see improvements in hospital free days when there are interventions that work and are effective. Um, our current barriers that both Ravi and I have identified are that um, most of our palliative care teams are reliant on us as clinicians to refer patients in. 
Um, we also know that it's reliant and the goals of care conversations are also reliant on oncology teams and oftentimes medical professionals who may be otherwise um, busy in clinic and may not actually have the adequate training or necessarily the time to document all of these conversations and certainly to conduct them longitudinally. And then we also know from Ruby's work that there's no scalable automated tools um, to help to identify the patients that may need more intensive conversations and the timing of those and when those need to happen. Ruby, are you online? Are you able to present your slide on your background work? Yep. Uh, can, every, can everybody hear me? Yes. I can hear you great. Okay, great. Great, uh, great to be on. Thanks, everyone, for the opportunity again to present this concept. Um, I didn't get a chance, by the way, earlier on to introduce myself. So I'm, I'm Ravi Parikh. I'm an, a medical oncologist at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think the, the idea of automated identification of patients who um, may be in need of, uh, you know, earlier goals of care communication uh, is um is uh, an area that's kind of coming into the fold, particularly with the availability of more advanced predictive analytics um, run through the EHR. Now, if we had unlimited resources, you know, I think the idea would be to try to um, have uh, early goals of care communication with everybody. Um, but I think that is sort of limited by um, the availability of time in uh, you know, a busy medical oncologist clinic and also um, you know, things like, uh, um, you know, clinician familiarity with having these conversations in, in routine practice. So one approach that we've tried to take is towards automated identification of patients who may need uh, more timely serious illness communication. This is a trial that I uh, co-ran with uh, Chris Manns, who's also in the audience, uh, using an electronic health record-based machine learning algorithm to predict 180-day mortality. Um, we, you can see some of the uh, variables um, that are collected through routine clarity extract, which is a, a, a downloadable database through EPIC um, in all EPIC instances across the country. Uh, and so these are sort of examples of, of variables that went into the machine learning algorithm, but they were featureized into around 150 or so variables that actually ended up in the algorithm. We've since incorporated metrics of PROs into um, our uh, version of the algorithm as well, um, and not only used those as features um, that we collect routinely, but also as part of the outcome, uh, since you know, perhaps it's not only mortality, for, but future symptom decline that we may want to predict. And so we validated this algorithm both retrospectively and prospectively um, in the mortality prediction version, demonstrating a positive predictive value of 51% and an area under the receiver operating characteristic curve of 0.88, which fares quite well compared to standardized regression-based um, pr uh, predictive tools. Um, we ran that, uh, we used that algorithm as part of a behavioral intervention at the University of Pennsylvania in a pragmatic step which trial uh, among uh, over 14,000 patients and showed that that uh, trial not only quadrupled rates of documented serious illness communication um, among oncology, between oncologists and their patients, but also led to downstream, um, um, you, know, you know, somewhat minor, but still uh, significant decreases in end of life chemotherapy um, and cost savings in the last month of life. Um, uh, the algorithm is available as a publicly available GitHub, and, and through a collaboration with Charlotte Lindball at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, we actually validated, uh, uh, externally validated a version of that using their EPIC instance and demonstrated similar uh, performance characteristics. So this is, um, you know, uh, one flavor of intervention that has been shown to increase goals of care communication. The main downside of it, though, in terms of scalability is, one, um, uh, you know, reliance on clinicians as end users and, and clinicians are busy. And even at our peak, we were only able to get to about 20% of patients who had a documented conversation up from a baseline of about 5% uh, in routine medical oncology care. Um, but then two, you know, up until recently, we haven't had a great mechanism of um, disseminating these algorithms across care systems. Everyone is on their own routine EMR. But the, uh, now that you know, with the availability of structured um, uh, uh, EPIC uh, data that is can be mapped to common data models, we can actually run uh, you know this code on downloadable extracts of data from uh, from EPIC um, and not run this through the EHR, but rather run it through routine downloads of the EHR that are happening at all these centers. Uh, and so you know that enables a, a, an element of scalability and dissemination for a concept like this that hasn't traditionally been available. 
Um, so maybe we can go to the next slide and we can de uh, describe um, Manali's work on lay health navigation for advanced care planning. So uh, this work was developed with formative um, research where we interviewed clinicians across the United States and we overwhelmingly heard from clinicians the lack of time and also the lack of reimbursement, which has subsequently changed. We also heard from patients that they had better conversations with patients in the waiting room. And so where I practice at the VA, we actually see veterans engaging in conversations and developing activation from one another, and then coming into the clinic, having a list of questions saying, you know, Mr. So-and-so who's on the same day as me told me I should ask about this. And he was asking me about this and told me I should know why I'm getting treatment. And so we decided to take and co-design this model. We also involved payers and said, we're gonna include you at the table. We started at the VA where it was an integrated health system and Unfortunately, in the healthcare system, finances don't align, but in the VA, it does. And so there was a real push to try to improve care and also reduce total costs of care. And so here we utilized um, a lay health worker and peer volunteers, so veteran volunteers. We trained them on a curricula that was developed by DJ, BJ Periacoil, who's a well-known palliative care physician, um, in a six-week module, um, 80 hours a week, very intensive training and essentially paired the lay health worker who conducted telephonic conversations and also occasionally would visit patients in the clinic room to engage patients in structured conversations over time. So they were one-to-one. -one. It was a six-month intervention. And what we found was overwhelming, robust impact, not only on goals of care documentation amongst the oncology clinicians. So the patients were coming in asking veterans, um, the veterans were coming in asking patients about their goals of care and asking them to document them in the chart. Um, we also saw reductions in acute care use, which then translated into reductions in total costs of care. Now, the intervention was only six months, and we followed patients for 15 months, and we saw a durable lasting effect and actually reductions at the end of life um, of about 95% of end-of-life acute care use for the patients that died at 15 months from the, the time of enrollment. And now we've demonstrated similar findings in a variety of settings. We've now launched um, a PCORI-funded study where we're seeing similar findings amongst eight VA facilities, six Kaiser facilities, a uh, couple of community oncology practices as well. There are about four to six that are enrolled, including Sutter, as well as um, a couple of academic centers, including UAB. Um, we've also demonstrated this apart from these sites and apart from the funded study in a Medicare Advantage-based organization down in Southern California. There were two papers demonstrating the impact of utilizing lay health workers with similar findings and also with a union, labor union organization out of Atlantic City in Chicago where patients were receiving care in a variety of community-based practices in those two cities. And now this is the pilot work that shows, um, you know, what you can do with algorithm-based initiatives to identify patients. We took the approach of feeling, I kind of feel that goals of care conversations should be like a driver's license when you go in and you're asked about whether you want to be an organ donor. We don't blink twice. And so that should be the way that, that I personally think goals of care conversations should be undertaken um, for patients, but we haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, with that lay health worker model, we did it for everybody with patients with stage three and stage four disease. And unfortunately, it was very time consuming for the community health workers and the lay volunteers to go in and screen for patients based off of a stage metric. And so we've been limited in terms of their own capacity for having to dig through the chart to see who has stage three, because it's not always easily identifiable, who has stage four. And even 10 years later, what we found are that there's a handful of patients that still haven't passed away. So maybe some of those interventions were, while they need to be light, there are very intensive interventions that could be created. So you can essentially stratify out the patients based off of an algorithm model, which we did here at Stanford. We used an AI approach and then also combined um, the lay health worker approach, and this is pilot data showing increases in documentation of goals of care um, in this approach. Ravi, do you want to take on the trial schema? Sure. So, uh, sorry. So the vision we have for, uh, for this trial across SWOG is to um, uh, among individuals with newly advanced, uh, uh, newly diagnosed advanced solid malignancies who are receiving systemic therapies at, um, at SWOG sites to um, randomize at the site level to uh, receipt of, um, of the algorithm-enabled intervention, APAC versus usual care, 
for individuals that are randomized to the intervention, we would um, run weekly, uh, at least you know, our, our regular um, uh, 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 runs of the predictive model on the back end clarity interface um, using the, the same weights that we've used in our validated model to um, identify a list of high risk patients that would be defaulted in opt out setting toward, uh, to receive uh, lay health navigation using the packed framework that Manali described. Um, this would uh, be you know, accompanied with monthly telephonic assessment with the patient or caregiver um, to assess patient specific outcomes that you can see on, on the outcome section there. Um, and unusual care individuals would you know, um, be recruited, individuals would be identified using the algorithm and um, would be followed using research coordinator, uh, using research coordinators at the site along these uh, secondary outcomes but they wouldn't um, be targeted uh, with the uh, lay health navigator intervention. Our primary outcome is this really innovative uh, um, outcome of hospital free days, which has been demonstrated as a uh, surrogate for goal concordant care and is applicable importantly um, to individuals who are not necessarily at the end of their life. Um, secondary outcomes we would measure uh, include patient activation and patient satisfaction and exploratory outcomes um, we would target for our, our aggressive end of life care among decedents. So that's a little bit of the, of the schema um, and we'd love to sort of uh, discuss with you all about uh, any general thoughts about the concept. So happy to take any questions uh, either from online or from the audience. So thank you so much for presenting. It was, uh, it's good to see all of your um, work sort of coming together in, in this um, uh, synergistic way. Um, I think what, you know, a lot of the pragmatic trials have, have had a home in cancer care delivery. And I think they're, you know, challenge, they all have their own challenges. So the biggest barrier is feasibility. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one of the things that the sites have come back to us with, with any kind of EMR based kind of intervention, I don't know exactly the mechanics of how the algorithm downloads, but most of the sites don't have like the IT approvals mm -hmm. to modify anything or you know, or not most, but a lot of them have said like that's a big barrier to participation. So I think one of the important things one would need to wrap their head around to do this in the network that we have, which is not integrated, mm -hmm. uh, unlike PAN and some of the VA systems, would be to really map out mm -hmm. what the, you know, a lot of the feasibility issues and what exactly would be required from the sites mm -hmm. um, to sort of say, this is what you would do under your cancer care, if it was a cancer care delivery study or whatever, that it would be, usually the pragmatic studies have to be done in cancer care delivery because of the funding mechanism, because the sites are funded to do a lot of this extra work as opposed to a per patient accrual. Um, and so really what the site would be expected to do regardless of what arm and then what external funding would support on top of that mm -hmm. and then pull together a group for stakeholder engagement so that you would really get the feedback you need in terms of are, do you have a sufficient number of sites that are interested and are willing to participate mm -hmm. Um, and what, you know, working with them to come together with what would be acceptable or not acceptable um, based on their institutional requirements. I don't know if that's helpful. But. It's very helpful. Um, you know, in, in my work, aside from Ruby's, which hasn't needed an EMR, we do all of that stakeholder engagement up front and we actually co-design the implementation. So there are slight variations, but it's, so it's practice specific, but these are very important points. And I think ones that we need to consider. Yeah, so yeah even I, just I, typically just from a structural perspective, like often what's done, it, you know, in collaboration with the specific, you know, committee like palliative care, or whatever that that, you know, you, we 
develop either these co-creation mm -hmm. kinds of modules for, you know, getting this kind of stakeholder engagement, write something up and then get feedback from the NCICCD committee. Um, because, uh, the NCI uh, gives a lot of feedback on like an Ames page or whatever, mm -hmm. because uh, it really ends up being collaborative with them and as well. Um, so um, having that, all of that information ahead, ahead of time uh, makes the study more successful. That's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And just, uh, we're, we're interested in feedback from uh, 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 different sites and, and different places about uh, impressions of the study, whether it's something that uh, might fit the site or feedback or ideas about that. You can reach Dr. Patel and Dr. Parikh or the co-chairs, and there'll be more to follow about this uh, in, in the next little bit. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, last but by no means least, we want to hear about the uh, uh, APP engagement project update from Drs. Uh, Christopher Ron Inglis and, and Jamie Myers. Thank you for uh, presenting and uh, let us know what's going on. Thanks so much. Um, can I advance the slide here? Okay, so as you may know, uh, Hope Foundation has funded a five-year APP engagement project. Um, it's funded year to year, but um, we've so far we've been doing well and we've had the support of the Nursing Research Subcommittee and the Palliative End of Life Committee. And in our first year, we were actually able to develop and deliver a, a symposium, an APP symposium, which really highlighted how APPs can be integrated into clinical research. Um, the second uh, thing that we've done is we did a workshop for APPs last fall, and it was really a nuts and bolts workshop for APPs. So they have more education because of the barriers that we've identify one is education. And now um, as of this meeting, we put together a task force um, of APPs and other stakeholders to work on um, identifying barriers and proposing solutions for um, into more APP integration into NCI sponsored trials and look really looking at SWOG trials and how we can integrate APPs more into SWOG research specifically. I'd like to say a couple of our new uh, uh, participants at the meeting today who came up were APP task force members. So we're super excited about that. And um, Jamie, would you like to add anything? But that's it. So we're really thinking. No, it's no, not. no. Okay. I wanted to just say one more word about some of the ways in which change has occurred at the NCI level um, related to policies on how APPs are now able to be more active participants in accrual and um, enrollment. So yeah, I can speak to that really quickly. So as of 2020, um, the EDCOR guidelines allowed for more um, enhanced and meaningful roles of advanced practice providers in NCOR um, related studies, which we can actually, um, as non-physician investigators, enroll our own patients and get credit for for you know for supportive care, cancer care delivery studies, which is super exciting. And then in 2021, a uh, CTEP changed their policy to us now allow us to sign for cancer treatment orders if we are able to do some do so within our state and our institution. So I really want to give a shout out to the NCI for really moving this initiative forward and also to Kate Castro, Andrea Denikoff, and Marge Good, who have been huge supporters of this initiative. So thank you. Anything I forgot, Very boss? <laughs> So again, our closure expert, Dr. Krauss, will uh, Time to say goodbye. final words. So, oh. Yes, Dr. Missions. This is Han. Yeah. Yes. Um, I just want to make a few comments. It won't take very long. I first, first went to my first SWOG meeting in 1979. And for the next 10 years, it was around three times a year. And in the 90s, it went down to twice a year. So I'm approaching my 100th meeting. And um, that's important because as some of you know, in the last five years, I've died, very closely died, almost died three times. So it's given me lots of perspective on thinking about 
paleo medicine and end of life. And so I've decided that to be optimistic. And when I hear all of the wonderful presentations today, it gives me great hope and hope is the word that we will make continued progress and it's wonderful in the way in which it goes. And to prove that, whenever I have an optimistic moment, which is more and more, I do a dance. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Frank. I don't know what to say after that. Hey, that's awesome. And those optimistic words, I think that's obvious from all the things that are, are going on in the committee. So we appreciate it. We want to continue to encourage new ideas, uh, new investigators. Please approach us. We hope we're approachable. Um, and, and we look forward to more great things happening from the committee. So thanks, everyone, for being here. <laughs>